You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 253. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The HitItBoard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to HitItBoard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's HitItBoard.com. Today, we're going to be talking about different learning patterns that you may see when you're out there training your agility dog. And uh, this is on my mind right now because I'm doing a lot of individual obstacle training right now, given the state that our current dogs are in. And I know Jennifer also is kind of in a similar boat. She's got some younger dogs that are um, going through that introduction to different obstacles. And And so um, you will see this in any dog training that you do with your dog, but I think it can be especially um, obvious when you are trying to teach something to your dog for the first time. And so I wanted to talk about um, how you may see your dog reacting to training when they uh, struggle a little bit, um, when they're still trying to figure out what you are teaching, that it's a, a new skill and they don't know what it is that you want. And then uh, given wh- what pattern you're seeing in your dog, what you should do with your training time. Uh, so the first one that I want to talk about I think is um, kind of fun. I, I really like this particular idea. Um, maybe it appeals to the lazy side of me because uh, the answer is it'll be okay. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> and that is um, latent learning. And we've talked about latent learning in the past, um, but there is uh, nothing that makes me believe in latent learning more than um, going through it again. So it's a, it's a concept that I'm familiar with, but every time I am taking a new puppy through new skills, it just hammers home in my brain this idea of latent learning. And, and latent learning just means that you go out, you work on a skill, um, you uh, put the dog away for you know, some amount of time, or you stop working on that skill. You come back to that skill at some point later, and the dog is actually better. It is like they learned when you weren't teaching them in that in-between time. They needed time to process it. And I think that this makes a lot of sense from a human perspective, right? That, you know, we think, of course, well, you know, you kind of mull things over, you're in the shower and you come up with an idea, like that seems reasonable. It seems less reasonable for dogs, but time and time again, we see this happening. So Jen, what are your thoughts on latent learning? Yeah, we uh, talked about this. Yeah, you're right. A recent podcast, um, I don't know, in the last year or so. And as you mentioned, I have three dogs right now that are under two years old. We're doing a lot of foundation training and a lot of obstacle training. And similar to you, I kind of forget about it until you're working through it. And my uh, young Border Collie High Five is become a total example of late learning when it comes to weave poles. I remember when I decided to start her weave poles, I would go out and I would train her. And I just kind of was like, man, she's not, not the sharpest tool in the shed. You know, things would be a little rough, you know, not anything horrible. And we'd come back, you know, two days later, even the next day. And she was like, oh, I got this. And she'd just nail it. She'd just get that skill, get that session, that particular entry. You know, we were working through some channels and some two by two stuff. And it always seemed the worse the session, I don't know that there's any science ones, but the worse the session, the better she was when she came back. I mean, I remember a session walking in and telling my husband, like, I don't know what to do. Her weefles are horrible. I just went out there, like, they're falling apart. It's like she's never seen them. And I was so frustrated. I just didn't train her for like five days, like just did not train her. And I came back like five days, six days later. And I was like, okay, we're going to give this another go. And she was like, oh, I got this. Nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. And I just remember running in and going, oh my God, she's the most brilliant dog I've ever had and my husband is not a dog person thinking I'm crazy he's like I thought you just said she was stupid I'm like stupid she just wasn't getting it and um she's really 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 made me um kind of believe in this late learning, seeing it firsthand. And so when I realized this is how the weave poles were going to go, um, I called her my little crock pot dog. 
So th- this kind of term crock pot, which was basically you'd go out, you'd kind of teach some skills. You say, okay, hey, we're doing a little of this, we're doing a little of this, you know, you add your ingredients in and then you just let it simmer. You just walk away, right? You put all your ingredients in the crock pot, you walk away for eight hours and then you come back and you have this delicious meal, right? So I would walk away from them and come back and she was just like, oh, I got this. It made training so much better once I figured out that learning pattern, because when we did have sessions that weren't perfect, I didn't get upset about it. Like if we had a session that was really bad, I was like, eh, it's all right. She's going to be better when we come back. Or I guess she's certainly not going to be worse, you know, um, not as bad as what it seemed like she was being. So I've really been experiencing it firsthand with High Five on her weave pull training. And I see it from a lot of dogs. And it's actually interesting because I just had a dog this week. We just reopened um, post-COVID, our state allowed opening on May 12th. And I had a student's dog, young, male border collie, very over the top, very excited, and really just wild and and you know, lacking some impulse control and would knock bars. And he wasn't able to do a whole lot on the break. You know, it was like eight, nine weeks of nothing, nothing. And the dog was brilliant. I mean, brilliant, like out of this world. Brilliant. And I just thought like, maybe that's what the dog needed. It needed to simmer, to take a break and come back. And in this case, we were talking more kind of headspace, but it's jumping was better. It's weaves were better. So it's a thing. And I think once you identify it, it, at least in my experience, made everything a little bit less discouraging and more approachable. Yeah, I think it's really important um, for a couple of different reasons. I think it's really important for your own mental state. So basically, don't panic. Um, But I think that the other reason it's really important to identify this, or at least to know that it is a possibility, is that if you have a dog that um, repeatedly kind of shows you this latent learning pattern, I mean, I think all dogs to some degree have it, but I think that there are definitely just some dogs where that is that is just how they learn. They learn in the time in between. And um, for, you know, if this is the way that your dog learns, if you will constantly change things in reaction to them not doing well, it can actually be less good for your training. Right. So, um, you know, if, if you go out and you have a session and the dog struggles and so you, the next time you go out, you change everything about it, right? You're like, I, I need to go back to square one or I need to go backwards a step. Um, you can actually confuse the dog or, or it not get the same, uh, jump forward that you would have. And, um, our golden retriever, Ellie, this is, you know, she is the latent learning dog. I, I learned from doing teeter training with her and with weave pull training with her. It is like clockwork. Every change that I make, because both of those obstacles, at least the way that I teach them, are very um, progressive in that, you you know, the teeter, you, you're you going to add height, you know, inch by inch. You're going to add drop inch by inch. So there's a very, very clear progression. And with the two by twos, you're going to, you know, start with one set and you're going to have your angles and you're going to, um, uh, then you're going to add a second set. So it's very clear progression. So with both of these skills, I would go out and she would um, do something and then I would think it, she was ready to progress. And so I would progress the skill and uh, it she would immediately look not that great. Um, and rather than making it easier, I would just say, okay, that session didn't go great. And then I came back the next day to the same uh, level. There's really no reason that she should should be good because uh, it's harder than the last thing she did well. And she didn't do uh, this new step very well. So there's no real reason for her to do well, but she looked just utterly brilliant. I mean, just absolutely amazing. Hitting everything 100% um, with speed, with, you know, excitement and enthusiasm and all of that looked absolutely fantastic. And so uh, I did very quickly realize that every change that I made, I just needed to stay there for two sessions, the bad session and the good session that was going to come right after it, right? So it might be two days or it might be a morning and an evening session. And then I would progress the skill again. And, um, and so, uh, like you said, a lot of it was just learning not to panic, learning not to feel like I, I've pushed this too fast. I need to go backwards. She, uh, you know, she clearly doesn't understand. Um, and giving her that time to kind of come back the next session and show me that she is okay, that she is confident, that she's found that confidence again, that desire again, that excitement again. 
Yeah, that's pretty much exactly how my sessions were high, with High Five were going. And I think, um, you know, the point about recognizing that and how it can, um, re- learning from the dog and kind of figuring out that they are those late learning styles totally can help you in formatting your session because I have seen what you've talked about where somebody will think, oh, well, my dog's just not getting it and they change the picture too much when in reality, the dog just needed time to think about it. So, you know, if you take a session and it went bad, when you come back, try it exactly where you left off before just saying, oh, well, two by twos aren't working. I need to go to channels or channels aren't working. I need to go to wires. So really good points there. Awesome. And, and it's not the only learning pattern. And so that's where things get a little bit tricky is um, you've got to identify if what your dog needs is um, more time or some time off to think about it, or if what your dog needs is a new approach. And so that's the next learning style or learning pattern that we want to look at, which is I'm calling it the reboot pattern. It's the start all over pattern. Something has gone wrong and you need to take a step back back, reevaluate, and come up with a new plan. And um, this actually has also happened to me with these, uh, these young dogs, and it also happened with Ellie. So it's not like a dog is, in all circumstances, going to always be a latent learner. Uh, it really depends on what they're learning and, um, and whether the progression that you're on is working for them. Um, so for, you know, as an example, um, with the Golden Retriever that uh, I was training right now, Um, In addition to her kind of falling apart every time I made things more difficult with the wheeze and the teeter, on the teeter specifically, there was a moment where things fell apart so bad that um, that she did not recover, right? She she not only did she look bad, but she she um, uh, couldn't do any of the things that she could do previously. And it was basically the moment that I added the first tip. So I was uh, training her uh, with a very uh, stationary Um, teeter using the tip assist, which I absolutely love. It's my favorite way. And then we have a podcast on that. Um, But at any rate, she was doing great running to the end of the board at different heights. And then I added the first tip, which was only, you know, an inch of tip. And she was like, forget this. (laughs) And actually both, I was, I was training both these dogs at the same time, which has really given me a lot of insight because you can, um, you know, sometimes they learn very differently, but sometimes they go through similar things and it can really help you identify where maybe um, you want to make some tweaks to your training. But both the dogs were like, nope, not getting on that thing again. You know, I don't care. I don't care what you do. Um, in your progression, I'm, I'm that I'm opting out of the teeter. And, uh, and so in that case, it wasn't a matter of, of uh, latent learning. I, I blew up the entire training plan that I had. um, And things had been progressing up to that point perfectly in a very latent learning style. You know, at every session, uh, I would keep it in the same spot for two sessions. And every session, they would look great on the second session. And we were going very slow and steady and making progress every, um, every couple of days. And, uh, but, but once I saw the way they were reacting to that, I went all the way back to the beginning and I did a lot more foundation on the actual movement of the teeter. And I changed my entire progression of uh, teeter training to um, work on some more tip lower and then to raise the height. Whereas previously my progression had been to raise the height and then start adding tip. So I just kind of, you can do it either way and, and both ways work. And I just said for these dogs, um, they need a different uh, progression. And so I, it, and, and at the moment that it happened, it kind of felt bad, right? Because I had been making great progress for, you know, a week and now I, it felt like I was just giving up on all of that, right? Maybe I could just push through, Um but in this case, that's not what they needed. And when I went back, the kind of the second time around, a lot of it went more quickly because some of it they were familiar with. Some of it they had had a lot of exposure to and they had had a lot of um, rewards for. And so even though I kind of uh, gave up and went back to the drawing board, I didn't lose all the benefit of the repetitions that I put in. And I was able to move forward more quickly and uh, get the performance that I wanted by kind of watching the dog. 
Yeah, ironically, I had a, a very similar scenario on a little bit more grand scale with the teeter. We didn't really talk about that in advance, but my experience of this kind of reboot is exactly uh, same piece of obstacle, ironically, but um, it actually happened with a seasoned dog that was competing. Um, she went last June to a USA regional, won the Grand Prix. She is a regional champion, and that was the last teeter she did for five months. Oh, my goodness. And I, yeah, yeah. So she did it there. Um, she never had the most perfect teeter, but it wasn't bad. Um, and she, after that, would not do it, would not do it. And I just thought, okay, well, we're going to go back to basics. So basically what I did is I went back and kind of reviewed how she had initially learned. And I redid the steps of everything that she had initially done, just redoing it five months. And finally, I realized we need a system reboot. This is not working. And I basically did a total rehaul. And it does, you know, kind of like you said, you almost, it, it almost makes you feel like a failure. Like, oh, my plan, this great plan, this thing that I have laid out didn't work. I failed as a trainer. I didn't work, but you can't look at it like that. That's why we're talking about these different patterns and different learning styles. Because in the end, now her teeter is better than it ever was. So I did a total rehaul. We trained uh, new words, new verbals, new method, added some props. I wanted to make it look as completely different as um, anything that she had done up to that point. And something about it, um, she just instantly was like, oh, this is what you want me to do? Got it. It was like all that time that I had been working for five months from June to December. It wasn't until mid-December that I got her to do a teeter again. I had been working and it just, we weren't making, I mean, she got to a point she wouldn't even do it in training. She wouldn't do it with food. She wouldn't do it in class. And um, I redid it, total new method, never had done it before with a dog. And I thought, what do I have to lose? And now her teeter is awesome. So I think, again, kind of what we talked about with the late learning, you can't get upset with the dog. You can't get upset with yourself. That's their style. This, the same thing, you know, all these learning styles can have kind of a mental impact on us. And it's just about learning the dog and working through it. And I did, I felt like a failure. I took a dog and I couldn't teach her a teeter and we, we couldn't do it in trials and she was stressing. But in the end, uh, she just needed something different. And now her teeter is better than it ever was. So I think uh, kind of that reboot in a lot of cases can actually end up with a better performance. And like you said, it went faster. It goes faster. They know some aspects of it. And at that point, you know more about the dog. And I think that's what it was um, for me when I started training her teeter she was a puppy, right? She's nine, 10 months, you know, year old, and you're doing teeter training. And by the time we had the, um, she was right about two when she stopped doing it. So about two and a half, by the time we retrained, she's a different dog at two and a half. I know she's a different dog. She knows she's a different dog. We now have two and a half years of being a team instead of eight months. So when those things happen, if they do happen down the road or they do happen with a seasoned dog, you guys know each other so much better. So I, th I think it really can prevent or present, excuse me, um, some tr real good training opportunities should that happen. Right. And I think that um, uh, it's not that, uh, I mean, there's a reason why there's lots of different ways to teach lots of different things, right? It's not that um, your plan is bad or your plan is a failure. It's just that this particular dog in this particular moment needs something different. And there's a reason why there's lots of different approaches to things. And I was kind of thinking about all the different ways that um, my daughter right now is learning math right? Like they, they, they'll do like some, um, they'll do it with estimation and then they'll do it with um, rounding and then they'll do it with uh, blocks that represent, you know, the hundreds and the tens and the ones, you know, there's all these different ways that they're learning math and really, you know, how many ways is there to teach two plus two equals four, right? Well, there's actually several and it helps them to see different uh, representations. And so I think that our dogs are no different um, in that regard. So then um, the final pattern is, it's kind of an anti-pattern actually of learning because it's, it's kind of how it looks when the dogs aren't learning. And that is um, just the dog that is stuck. Uh, the dog that has um, been at the, at the same level, getting the same amount of challenge and isn't progressing. So uh, you don't have the brilliant jump up in performance that we see with latent learning. Uh, you don't see also the falling apart that we see when you need a reboot. Um, instead, you see the dog kind of doing the same thing over and over, but not really progressing. And I think this can be really hard to break out of. Um, and this can be where a lot of trainers get stuck. Um, and so I think um, in general, 
I think that if, if you are feeling stuck, it's probably best to push forward a little bit uh, in your training to challenge the dog a little bit um, to see if you can get a little bit of a breakthrough in learning. So add a little bit of challenge. You know, if you're stuck at one particular entry in the weave poles, right? Adding a little bit of challenge and then giving your dog that one to two to three sessions to see if um, they can figure it out. They can start progressing. They can get some of the benefit of that latent learning. Um, and then if you are still not progressing, then I think you have to consider whether you need a new approach. And so it's almost like give your dog the benefit of the doubt in terms of um, seeing if latent learning will do it for you. Um, but if you're stuck in one spot for, you know, session after session after session after session, then you need to go back and think about whether you need a reboot. I think one of the things kind of along this same line um, that I talk to a lot of my students about live and those of you who have worked with me on VIP know I'm kind of on the tendency of, okay, let's keep going. Let's get going to the next step. Uh, that kind of tends to be my teaching style is that, that you want to be progressing and working through your training sessions with that kind of 80, 20 success failure rate. Um, and I know a lot of us have heard that before 80% success, 80% success, no more than 20% failure. But I think what some people get kind of forget, and I know that I recently was told this by some by an instructor I was training with when high five was a puppy, and it's like I know it, but I needed to be told it, is I was having all these sessions of 100% success, and they were just going real slow, and I was like, oh, look, 100%, oh, 100%, and I was told, well, if you're not having at least some failure, you're probably not moving. moving forward quick enough. You need to get, is the dog learning? Are they making a mistake and realizing hmm, that didn't get reinforced? I need to do something different. Or is that behavior just happening? You know, is the dog doing it or are they learning it? And I think one of the things that I see people when they get stuck is they're they kind of what you said, they're not moving forward fast enough. And I know that sounds really counterintuitive because you think if your dog is stuck on a skill, why would you move forward? But I'll have people who will do 20 reps and the dog will fail on one. And they think, oh, I can't go forward. So I've been stuck here. I, I'll do this and he fails on this one out of every 20. Well, one out of tw every 20, I'd keep going, keep moving on, right? You know, um, and so I am constantly telling people, you know, you're not necessarily looking for a goal of 100% success rate in a teaching phase, right? I mean, once the obstacle's done, sure, we want them to be perfect on it or do it every time. But when you're learning, if you're getting 100% every time, you might not be going to the next level. You might not be making it uh, difficult early enough. So go ahead and keep going. Know in that scenario, a little bit of failure or what people would say, my dog is stuck because they're not 100%. They call it stuck. A little bit of failure is okay, as long as we don't drop below that kind of 20% failure rate. So um, again, you know, I, I knew it, but when I was told it, it was basically, it was, it was Justine Davenport. I'll give her the credit. She looked at me and she goes, yeah, if you're not having some failures, you're not moving forward fast enough. And I was like, duh, I know that that makes total sense, <laughs> but I needed to hear it. It's like I, I needed to hear it because it's like, I know, but I needed to hear it. Um, that you're right. It's like, if I'm not moving forward and I'm not progressing if I'm not having that little bit of failure there. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I think, you know, keeping that in mind and that, that getting stuck, defined stuck, I guess that's a little bit of it. I'm here to say, I think a lot of people say they're stuck when really that's just a failure or two um, and to kind of keep going and keep pushing through. But at some point, as you mentioned, you will need to reevaluate and um, possibly consider something different more on long the, the reboot. Right. Yeah. Because I guess if you're doing the same thing over and over and over and you're, you're still not where even even moving towards where you want to be, then even though the dog is um, doing what you're asking in that moment, if you can't ever ask for more, then, uh, then yeah, you need to start thinking about something different. Yeah. And I do think, um, you know, talking about these different methods and learning patterns as people think, well, I don't know where my dog falls in, or I haven't really thought about it. Keep in mind, you know, it's, it's not like there's just these three, but some of you guys might have dogs that I call very traditional learners. I'm uh, working with my young Sheltie right now who just turned a year, and I, I'm talking to you about this. We've discussed this. We've been uh, sharing notes, and he's not really any of these. He's just a very honest true to form learner. He, I teach him something. He understands it. If he gets reinforced, he tries harder if he doesn't. And he learns at a very 
normal rate. And I'm going to guess that a lot of people who maybe have dogs like that, but you know, aren't resonating with this podcast maybe as, as much as some of the others of you are, but do keep in mind, you know, there are those dogs too. There are dogs that just kind of have what I call steady, normal, you know, uphill, climb the mountain, no high peaks, no, um, no dark valleys. And they're just kind of steady learners and, um, comparing high five to Vento, it's been a very different journey just because Vinto is very steady and predictable and, you know, easy to train and high five gives these emotional highs. And then she drops down because of that kind of late learning. So, you know, there's always that uh, different, different learners out there. And some of you guys may just be, have some very normal progressive dogs out there and that's, that's perfectly fine too. Great, great, great point. All right. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. Uh, go go out, train your dog, uh, and uh, keep these tips in mind. And uh, above all, don't panic. Uh, everything, whether your dog is stuck, a latent learner, needs a reboot, or is uh, you know this nice, steady, progressive learner, no matter what, at all times, it's just information for you on what you need to do in your next session. So every session is just information for the next. Um, and there's, there's really nothing more uh, to it than that. It's not, um, it's not a referendum on you as a trainer or even worse, you as a person. Uh, it's just um, information. So go out there, get the information you need and make progress in whatever way you can. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training. What do you call a fake noodle? An imposter.